Welcome to Utopia Live. Utopia is a global SAP partner, providing data-driven business solutions to asset-intensive as well as retail and fashion industries. Focused on data quality, migrations, and governance solutions that enable organizations to harness high-quality data to take cost out of their business, maximize operational performance, automate and streamline, and better leverage technology investments. Thanks for joining today. This interactive event is designed to allow you to fuel your initiatives. You're encouraged to be engaged and ask questions from today's subject matter experts. And now, it's time for Utopia Live. Gentlemen, good, good morning. Welcome to Utopia Live. How are you today, guys? Good hey, morning. Tom. How are you? Very, very good. Very good. And, uh, and, and today I'm joined by Michael Begala. Michael is uh, an IT executive at FlowServe Corporation alongside Scott Barrett, who is vice president here at Utopia. Uh, and rounding out today's panel is Luke Kwong. Luke is a director of cloud platform and MDG and EIM go-to-market teams at SAP. Uh, and uh, as, as I mentioned, we had a little bit of audio difficulties there. And I said to Michael and Scott, good morning. And to Luke, uh, it's obviously a good evening for you in Singapore. And Michael, uh, to get us kicked off, you and I have known each other for, for quite some time, but I, I learned something new about you recently. Uh, and that is in your free time, you, you dabble in 3D printing, a little bit of additive manufacturing type stuff. That is true. I, uh, I enjoy doing design and taking things from concept to fruition. That's that's excellent. That's that's absolutely phenomenal. And, and do, do you have a, a, a certain kind of design concepts that you work with? Is it kind of consumer stuff or just stuff that you tinker around with? Or no, we're uh, we focus a lot on consumer products, um, device mounting in the home automation control space. Just a, a side hobby and a. A little bit of a, uh, an additional revenue generator for the family. Very good, awesome. And, and Scott, we know that uh, you're in the middle of doing some uh, renovation work at home right now. You're, I think, uh, you've got a, a lake cottage. You're in the middle of putting in a deck. How, how's it going? Is the the the, the dock in yet? Um, well, it's 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 a structure. We're trying to get it finished. So um, if it'll stop raining here long enough, we've had a tropical depression and a tropical storm in the last like eight or nine days so if it won't flood maybe we'll get there <laughs> yeah it's uh it's certainly been a rainy spring i think we all can uh, can empathize with that uh and uh, and i'll go ahead and, and, and check and see if, if luke Kwong, luke do we have you on audio yet i know we had some uh, technical difficulties ah uh, yes can you hear me yes we can hear you luke good good evening yes. and, and luke, you're you're in singapore yes i'm sorry you kind of my camera is not working it, at least the audio has been picked up. Very good, Luke. Well, hey, it's uh, it's 2020. Uh, we're living in a Zoom go-to-meeting world right now, uh, always right with last-minute technical difficulties. So we will push forward. Um, today, guys, I, I don't want to chew up too much time. I, I know our audience is very excited to jump into things. We're talking about a, a topic of great interest right now, and that's all things S4 HANA transformations, migrations, implementations, best practices around those. Uh, obviously, uh, there are some very challenging conditions right now in, in the uh, external business environment. Uh, we're living in a COVID-19 world, soon to be hopefully a post-COVID-19 world, but what that's done uh, is it's caused delays in those transformation projects. It's caused them to be paused or perhaps even pushed out indefinitely. And what we're going to be talking about today are ways to get those projects jump started again, extract immediate business value as you prepare for those projects in the future, uh, and 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 really take uh, take apart what we're calling the no regrets steps uh, to move forward with those initiatives. Do so quickly uh, with immediate business value. So without further ado, we're going to go ahead and jump right into things with just some quick housekeeping notes. Uh, if you'd like to change the view of the screen, maybe uh, uh, maximize webcam views or uh, maximize the view of the presentation decks that will be shared, you can toggle that at the top of your screen. Also, keep an eye on the chat box uh, in the control panel area of the GoToMeeting 
uh, panel. Uh, there you'll find a link to schedule a post webinar meeting with Scott and the S4 HANA subject matter expert teams. Go ahead, click that link, get those meetings scheduled. The teams are happy to uh, speak with you, answer any questions that you have. This is all about empowering your initiatives and the team stands by uh, ready to support you and, and answer any questions that are top of mind for you. Uh, also, this is again, all about empowering your initiatives, helping jumpstart your program. So we want to focus on the questions. Go to the question box in the control panel, start typing in your questions now, type them in throughout the presentation, type them in when the presentations are over, but most importantly, don't forget to type this in, type your questions in, this is all about you. So with that, I am going to hand it over to Luke Wong, Luke, Director of Cloud Platform, EIM and MDG Go-To-Market Teams at SAP. Uh, Luke, if you would, please, please go ahead and, and get us kicked off this morning. Thank you, Thomas. So can you hear me clearly and see my screen? We sure can. Okay, great. Good day, everyone. Um, as you can see in this picture, this is Singapore. I live and grew up here. And aside from accidents, actually, I actually had a um, accidental crash in the bicycle, uh, from my bicycle on Monday. So thankfully, you can't see my have the video camera. Otherwise, you'll see how bandaged I look right now. But I'm really happy I'm here and talking to you right now. So other than those kind of challenges, mishaps, and struggles here and there, I must admit that I have never, ever experienced something on the scale and level as what the current COVID-19 pandemic has brought about. These pictures that we'll see over here can at best only capture a tiny fraction of what is happening out there. You see idle aeroplanes, empty supermarket shelves, empty streets, schools and learning institutions gone virtual, with students from disadvantaged or low income homes not quite coping so well, restaurants, entertainment halls, sporting venues crying out to be filled with real people, Event even businesses, large and small, have been greatly impacted. In fact, it, it has been said that as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, the global economy will be increasingly digitally driven with five years of digital adoption around the world being compressed into just eight weeks. So that's amazing, right? Many businesses will be forced to redefine the end-to-end -end customer experience to deliver a step-up change in productivity and to transform workforce engagement. Now, if you stop to think about these needs, these requirements actually embody what becoming an intelligent will accomplish. In the SAP, our belief is very simple. A move to SAP s is a first step in becoming an intelligent enterprise. Why, you might ask? Well, because we have seen how many companies have run better or best with SAP S4 HANA. Just as an example over here, we see companies having transformed to running under best run business models, resulting in overhaul of corporate strategy with over 10% increase in revenue from new offerings and customer satisfaction, deliver better customer value, through over 60% reduction of total vendor invoice processing time and between 10 to 30% increase in on-time deliver deliveries. And we even see rapid and accurate decisions with over 40% reduction of time spent on period and closure, as well as even 30% reduction of risk and compliance costs. And that's not even talking about other tangible benefits to IT and operations as well. Now, now, we believe that any move to s hana presents a fantastic opportunity to improve data, content, and processes. According to the latest SAP Insider report, about 42% of respondents chose cleansing, deleting, and archiving data to minimize SAP HANA footprint and minimizing the downtime during migration to s hana as a top strategic priority. Other interesting statistics include 56% of CEOs are concerned about the quality of their data. Only 3% of company data meets a minimum threshold for data quality. 
and only 16% of migration projects were on time and on budget, while 64% were late, according to the law. Now, as companies or organizations move to Esmohana to become intelligent enterprises, they will find that their data feed intelligence, which in turn feeds process automation, innovation, and insight. Intelligent enterprises effectively use their data assets to achieve their desired outcomes faster and with less risk. So the challenge therefore to you is to put data first. That's the first concept I'd like you to remember out of this uh, webinar. And the thing is that we believe that organizations that do not start with data management strategy will only struggle to achieve their transformational goals and they will be challenged to make an efficient move on migration to s 4 hana So what will be a better, faster, safer, and cheaper way to move to s 4 hana One of the ways we have seen that has been successful is to deploy SAP Master Data Governance as a bridge to s 4 hana Why would you be asked? Well, we have seen that somebody having s MDG now will help ensure your data quality and readiness even before an operative s hana implementation. And this will reduce your risk for deployment and operations. And two, MDG is a good way to get experience with a controlled subset of s hana before a full-blown implementation. And lastly, MDG is a good way to establish strong governance processes that will help maintain master data quality after your s hana has gone live. So those are the key things I'd like you to remember. So at this point, I'd like to we want to hear how Utopia can help you begin your journey to s hana So I'm going to let you hear from Scott Barrett on his insights. Scott, over to you. Great. Thanks, Luke. So um, again, Luke, that was a great introduction. And again, thanks for taking time all the way from Singapore. Um, you know, you and I have worked together for an awful long time now around, you know, helping companies with data issues. And, and one of the things I always find interesting is statistics often uh, compete with each other. Uh, you know, you had a much higher uh, statistics around success of data migration, success of, uh, you know, different projects. Um, we focused a little bit and some polling that we found said that nearly just over a third of all S4 HANA projects actually struggle due to data issues. Now, sometimes that's migration. Sometimes that's user acceptance based on the quality of the data in the new system, because, you know, you can have the shiniest new, you know, great S4 system with amazing capabilities, but at the same, you know, so if Scott Barrett's still in there 12 times as a customer or a prospect or an employee, you know, that's that's still, you know, not great from a from an S4 perspective. So, so but again, you know, data is a huge impact, and, and it's something that companies, as you said, generally don't focus on enough. They're, they're, they're really focused on the system and deploying the system successfully. And, and those are huge, huge to get all those business gains that you showed, uh, Luke. So, um, so, so again, but, but really just trying to say that, you know, independent of COVID, independent of anything we're doing, you know, data is a huge struggle and challenge, as you said, to, to any S4, successful S4 HANA program. Um, I, I want to just take a minute. I want to talk about three key concepts here for a moment. Uh, cover three customer examples of, of how companies are, are adapting in these times to, to, to their S4 programs and, and present three ways Utopia can help. And then let Michael talk to you guys, uh, probably most interesting part of the day around from a practitioner perspective and actual from a client side, you know, what what's actually going on, you know, with them and, and, and managing all these, um, you know, competing initiatives. So I found a report in the register that basically said that, you know, companies that are already underway on their S4 journey, they may be paused. They may not be able to get 50 consultants in a room to, to finish a program, but, but they are going to finish. They, they're, they're, they're doing it remotely. Uh, they're going to start back when they can. But, but the real challenge is going to be companies that knew it was coming. Maybe they, 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 they saw the, the end of life for, for ECC, you know, R3 and said, hey, what are we going to do? And a lot of those companies are actually saying, hey, we, we, we're just not going to take this on right now. It's just too big. We got, you know, just trying to keep the lights on and keep the products moving out the door. So, so I think that really is an area to focus on is and to differentiate between, you know, in-flight, you know, S4 programs and new or planned S4 programs, either near term for 2021 through like, you know, 2020, 2021 and 2022. Um, so, you know, these, these, these projects are paused, delayed, canceled. 
um, people are in some cases due to budget. You know, they're just because of the economic impact, they, they don't have the budget to move forward. Uh, again, staffing, just logistics of, of, of large groups of people being together certainly don't work, particularly from inside the company and maybe from, from you know, tier one consulting firms or whoever is, is actually doing the implementation and just other priorities. Again, you know, we, we need to keep the lights on. We need to keep the, the, the products moving out the door. We need to keep our facilities open um, and, and be able to work remote and pivot towards that. So, so you know, if, and then the last question is, if, if regardless of why, what, what should we do instead? We, we, we had a lot of time and planning invested in doing something. We have resources that were available, uh, maybe budgets that were available. So what else can we do while our program you know, gets ready to, to go again, whether it's in three months or three weeks or, or three years? Um, and the answer are our data programs. Um, one of the great things about working with your data is it's something that can be done remotely. Um, there are, are there are companies or you can do it yourself where you can go in and understand what's wrong with your data. You can build programs to, to make it better using, you know, technology like uh, data services from SAP or machine learning capabilities or, or even just your own, you know, subject matter experts. Um, and, and you can do that in, in small bite sized chunks and you can make improvements on your data that have value now or you can decide to, do, to, to really take on a bigger project. Um, you often have a lot of underutilized uh, subject matter experts. Um, I was talking to a client actually down in Australia and they're doing a lot of field data collection on their assets right now. And they're using parking attendants because nobody's driving, so they're writing parking tickets, but they actually have the people out taking pictures of brass tags on their assets, um, collecting missing data, getting it all right in their system. So they're keeping these people working and effective even when their primary roles uh, you know, don't make sense right now. Um, and, and the most important thing is by doing these things, you can reduce costs. I mean, you can take, you know, you can take 10 to 20 percent out of your MRO spare parts inventory by doing this for a project. This is real money. Um, you can increase your productivity of your, your maintenance staff or other workers, um, you know, and you can improve your reporting and the information because you're it's so important right now to know exactly what's going on with your business because companies are operating on that knife edge of, of profitability or growth and, 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 and accurate information to, to do your analytics is, is, is critical. And at the end of the day, as Luke said, we, we believe and, and we believe emphatically that the SAP Master Data Governance Platform is the right thing to, to begin with. Because first off, you as you begin these cleaning projects, you, you need a place for that, that clean data, reference data to live that you can use, whether it's customer data, business partner data, material data, asset data, you know, so people can, can drive the value under the, we just talked about from, from before. Um, the second thing is, you know, data degrades at 4% a month. So you need to keep that data clean until you get to that S4 program and then have the restart. So MDG gives you the way the workflows, the business rules, the way to, to, to manage that data and, and keep the data clean from all the hard work. And the last piece, as Luke mentioned, is, is typically people will deploy MDG as a little standalone system. And they'll do that on top of an S4 instance, a small little S4 instance. Um, and that gives you the ability for the first time to, to play with S4, to have it in your environment in a very safe, controlled way and get the capabilities and the skills, both IT and otherwise, that will help you, you know, once you tackle your larger transformation program for your core instance. Three customer examples. Um, anybody that tuned in our last webinar, I heard a lot more about this one, but I just couldn't let it go because it's such a, a no regret step is, is really, you know, we had a Fortune 50 CPG company that had selected Utopia to work as, as their data partner on their S4 transformation. Um, when that, you do their data migration, get their data cleaned up. And when that paused, they said, well, you know, can we still work on our data? So I think it's really important. You guys help to see the value there. And so, so we did that. And then literally they, they said, well, now we've got a, a broken uh, piece of equipment. We don't have the spare parts. And we actually helped them find a spare part in another factory because they couldn't get it from a supplier. It was a, it was a functional equivalent that, that helps them. And we're doing that across their, their many global factories right now in the meantime. So there's so lots of ways we can, we can help and, and data can help um, you know, solve very specific business problems right now. Um, another one, we've got a highly verticalized chemical company we've been working with for a while. Um, they were starting with MDG for materials um, the second half of this year. S4 for them was still probably a two to three year away. You know, they'd already made that decision and, and they have a plan for it, but it was it was a ways out. Um, and they they decided that they were going to deploy MDG in the hub for exactly that reason, to get that S4 experience um, and move forward. And um, the third piece is even though they have, um, you know, delayed that that project by, by about 90 days to get started with that, 
they already had put budget in for doing all that data cleanup around their material data. And they said, hey, again, that's something we can do now. So let's shift some budgets around. We'll push the money off of implementation out a little bit and pull the money in for doing the data work right now. And let's get to cleaning up those materials. And the final one, the final one is a, a global equipment manufacturer focused on heavy asset industries. I won't say much more about it. But, but this is a company that, that really, I think, you know, blazed the trail by beginning their MDG program, you know, well ahead of their S4 initiative because they saw the value in the data with their corporate transformation and, and really built a, a great business case across their engineering groups, their supply chain, their finance groups to improve their master data and are, are, are moving forward with the kind of data cleansing enrichment program around their items, you know, despite some of these headwinds. And, and they took that same approach we talked about. They started small, a particular business line got it cleaned up, worked with the SMEs, and we helped them uh, completely hands off. And, and they use that to build the business case for, for the tackling the, the data, uh, you know, on a larger scale. And again, three ways we can help, and we've already covered a lot of these. The first thing we can do is we can help you understand what to do. We can understand what's good or bad with your data and baseline that for you. We can help you build a business case, either small or large, so you can get started now. And we can give you an approach that says, here's how you can start eating the elephant, and here's where it makes the most sense to start, given your current business priorities, given the budget constraints you may have, given the focus in other areas, you still should get started now. And we can help you understand that in many cases, um, you know, and, and know we're a little charged for, for doing some of those initial engagements. So, so again, big plug here for our 15 minutes with our subject matter experts and around any or all of these areas. These are, these are really, you know, helping you understand what you can do is the first step. Um, as I mentioned, demonstrating value is critically important in this current uh, economic environment. So how to get quick wins, how to, how to show measurable value, how to manage scope and budget and where to focus really helps you, again, build that kind of case. If you can't go do it all at once, you know, how can I get started and, and make incremental improvements and you get the data snowball and moving faster and faster and, and again, showing the, the real returns from it. And, and as I said, you know, that lets you start now, you know, figure out your data readiness, do some data improvement. You know, deploy MDG to start keeping your data clean and use as a staging area and learn S4 as the underpinning for that so you can prepare for your larger S4 initiative. Um, with that, I, um, I think I'm out of time. And um, again, I'm really excited to, uh, to turn over to my friend Michael Bagala, who not only makes 3D stuff for your home, has the coolest toys in his office that he's made of any, any company I get to go hang out with. So, uh, so Michael, again, thanks for being here. And, and I'd love to have you tell us a little about what you guys have been doing on the data side. Scott, thanks very much. <clears throat> Can everyone hear me? Yes. Sir. All right. I've started to share my uh, slide deck. Mm -hmm. uh, let me know once you're able to see it. We can see it. Awesome. Awesome. Um, well, first off, welcome, uh, everyone. Good morning to those folks here in the U.S. And if we've got any overseas folks, uh, good afternoon to you. Um, I'd like to start with a brief uh, overview of uh, FlowServe, um, as it serves as a really good backdrop to our particular master data journey. Uh, FlowServe is a global manufacturer and aftermarket service provider of flow control solutions. Uh, this includes uh, commercial valves, pumps, and seals. Uh, FlowServe was uh, established in 1997 through the merger of two flow control companies, uh, and our products and brands date back to the late 1700s. Uh, with just under $4 billion in revenue, we serve customers around the globe from our 300 facilities. And our flow control solutions are leveraged in a variety of industries, uh, with oil and gas being the largest, contributing uh, about 40% of our revenue on an annual basis. Over the past 200 years, FlowServe has largely grown through merger and acquisition and has historically managed newly acquired companies as individual P&Ls with a high degree of autonomy, but with limited focus on integrating uh, the various business operations. Uh, that strategy has resulted in a highly fragmented IT landscape. Um, we currently run our global business with uh, for over 40 ERP systems today. But with new executive leadership and a freshly minted strategy that's branded FlowServe 2.0, uh, we've embarked on our SAP MDG and our S4 HANA journey um, back in 2018 and have made good progress since. Unfortunately, COVID-19 hit, followed by the Russian and Saudi oil war, resulting in the price of oil plummeting to historic lows. 
Uh, these events began an economic and market downturn that is likely to last uh, into 2021. I presented this particular slide last year at the ASUG uh, Best Practices in Oil and Gas Conference in Texas. Um, and it underscores that no matter how well laid out your MDG program may be at the start, it will undergo many unanticipated twists and turns that you'll need to adapt to and respond to. Uh, in that presentation, I highlighted the various twists and turns that FlowServe has gone through in their MDG journey and left an open spot for the quote unquote next challenge we might face. Not knowing at that time what it might be, but realizing that something eventually would throw a wrench into the engine. Uh, in hindsight, this may have been a bit of a foreshadowing of the time that we find ourselves in today. The FlowServe 2.0 strategy that I mentioned uh, was the catalyst for over 200 large enterprise-wide programs, including master data governance. As COVID-19 began to take hold, the implications of this new world reality on large programs really began to come to light. Social distancing meant that conducting workshops and training would become more difficult. Uh, programs including MDG rely heavily on gathering cross-functional and cross-regional requirements, uh, oftentimes with large groups of people. Furthermore, the business process implications of instituting data governance drives the need to train users on new master data processes and tools. Similarly, working from home requires a bit of a program management mindset change, especially for companies like FlowServe that have historically operated under a work from the office policy. Uh, furthermore, absenteeism related to COVID-19 can introduce challenges with IT and business participation. Our MDG rollout plan was heavily aligned by ERP system, the 40 ERPs that I mentioned earlier, and was predicated on all sites running their business on a given ERP system, moving under MDG governance all at once. Now site shutdowns due to COVID-19 risk disrupting our rollout schedules. Travel restrictions can make it difficult to get program resources to where they need to be. Managing rollouts in other parts of the world without folks traveling is certainly possible, but it introduces risks to timelines and risks to existing business operations. And lastly, as with most companies, all large capital programs come under review during economic downturns to determine their ongoing viability. And our MDG program was definitely no exception. Now, any one of these implications may not seem too big. However, in combination, they introduce considerable uncertainty and risk. And an interim approach was needed to ensure that strategic programs could move forward, that momentum could be maintained while rethinking how their execution should change to best account for this new COVID-19 reality. At FlowServe, many of our large monolithic programs were replanned with a shift towards smaller initiatives that still help to fulfill the vision and objective of those larger programs. Knowing that we wanted to keep up the momentum we had established with MDG, we looked for ways to further our long-term data goals and objectives. In a sense, we wanted to lay out a bit of a detour from our existing plan that leveraged work already completed and that would align with key business objectives identified in light of the economic downturn. Whatever we came up with needed to deliver short-term benefit while avoiding adverse impact to an already stressed business organization. Lastly, it had to address the risks and uncertainties that we covered on the prior slide. For us, the answer was found through partnership with our finance organization. FlowServe embarked on a journey several years ago to better align our finance organization with more of a one FlowServe mindset by centralizing our financial processes carried out in each of our sites. These processes would move into a global shared service center established upon S4 HANA. And the goal of that program was the elimination and standardization of duplicative processes while also focusing on optimizing headcount 
across payables, receivables, general ledger, and ultimately master data management. Essentially lifting what was being done in 300 disparate locations into a global business service center that we call the BSC. Now, good progress has been made in moving sites into this new model. However, full benefit wasn't always realized because of operational challenges that arose post-transition. These challenges were often tied to poor quality data. Although master data was on the checklist for each transition, more focus and attention was placed on transitioning AP, AR, and GL related activities and processes. This proved to be an important lesson learned. The opportunity in front of us as we got into this new COVID-19 world was to figure out how to leverage progress made with our MDG program and focus on the master data route of these operational issues. Where phase one of our program laid the groundwork for cleansing and governing our master data with the solution now rolled out to sites in the US, further rollouts are unfortunately on hold due to COVID-19 and the depressed oil market. But by focusing our efforts in this way, we could further our MDM vision, albeit at smaller scale, while directly helping a key business initiative. And so over the past two months, we've developed a playbook for ensuring appropriate master data focus when transitioning new sites into our business shared service center. The playbook leverages much of the MDG investment we've already made, including our data dictionaries, our data quality rules, our standards, our information steward scorecards, and our data services cleansing and enrichment packages. Our data management team is now actively participating in each finance site transition being uh, in bringing the focus of master data to them, all in partnership with our finance and our BSC leadership. Now, although we will be stopping short of being able to actively govern each site's master data using MDG, we will have gone a long way towards cleaning up data in preparation for resuming our MDG rollouts in hopefully the not too distant future. And along the way, we will have helped closer more fully realize the intended benefit of a finance shared services organization. Thanks, Scott. All right, gentlemen, that was a phenomenal series of, of presentations. Uh, and I can tell that because I see the questions rolling in right now. So I know uh, folks uh, were definitely very interested in what you had to share. Uh, we're now going to move into the question and answer period of today's Utopia Live. I think it's the most uh, impactful uh, portion of the Utopia Live because we get to answer your very questions. So please do go to the question tab in your GoToMeeting uh, or go to webinar control panel, type your questions in now, continue typing them in. We will try to get through as many as possible. But to go ahead and get us kicked off, I'm gonna go to the very first question that came in. Uh, perhaps, Luke, maybe a question for you. Uh, do we need to have SAP MDG in the system landscape to consolidate master data? Could you say that again, please? Sure. Do we need to have SAP MDG in the system landscape to consolidate master data? Well, <clears throat> it is uh, not a requirement, but it is uh, definitely an advantage to have SAP MDG if you really got SAP in your landscape because SAP MDG is really tightly integrated with the SAP landscape. So you simply will save in your integration and a lot of uh, tr trouble trying to do all this integration yourself because SAP will have done all the heavy lifting in, in setting up all the integration. So all you have to do is basically work on your project plan and work on your migration initiative and your consolidation and all these tasks will be easily taken care of by us. And then you can uh, worry on the, um, on the, what, the data quality of all your master data and, and the processes that needs to be handled easily. So MVG actually takes care of all this for you. So having MVG is a, uh, definite advantage for consolidation in your migration. Great, thanks. Thanks for that, Luke. And uh, Scott, uh, a question I, I think that's, that's well suited for you. Uh, I know just from conversations that you and I have, you're, you're very kind of passionate about this 
topical area. Uh, organizations says uh, are struggling right now to, to kind of keep things afloat, keep the lights on, if you will. Uh, why is this stuff that we're talking about today, why is this important in this situation where we're just trying to keep moving forward? Yeah, that's a great question, Tom. And, and real quick, on, on just to, to add on to something with Luke's question, then I'll, then I'll pivot back. Um, another approach right now where, as you heard from Michael, moving forward, large global MDG or, you know, which is basically another small instance of SAP, you know, deployments can be challenging. There are a lot of great hosting options out there, either with hyperscalers, with SAP themselves, or with partners like Utopia that can stand up a, uh, you know, kind of fit the standard uh, instance of, of MDG and what other domains you want that you can start using as that that control point and that that hosting place to, to, to maintain your master data. So that was just, sorry, on the, on the previous question. Um, specifically now, I, I think, you know, Michael really highlighted it. You know, there are ways to save real money by, by focusing on your data. There's ways to improve, you know, again, improving wrench time from some of our past Utopia lives. You know, this is a 25% improvement. That tra translates directly into productivity, into headcount. Um, again, hard dollar savings with MRO supply chains, saving 1% of a large capital project. You know, you're not going to stop building a new refinery just because of COVID. You've got to finish it. But if you could save 1% on a billion dollars, that's a lot of money. So I, I think that, that it really is that, that combination of what's the value and how can you find a place in the organization to focus on it. And I, I give Michael credit of, of bringing together the technology side with the, the MDG program and the business shared service. And, and there was a point where I think Michael showed that they could save, you know, 90% of the headcount they thought they estimated in that new business shared service by effectively deploying MDG. That's the kind of conversations you have to have either as external consultants or someone that really understands the business and the data value like Michael does to, to drive that. So I think I think there are really strong ways and, and even even the previous example of the palletizer that didn't work, you know, and, and they couldn't get the products out the door and they couldn't find a spare part because there are no spare parts. It's the you know, toilet paper problem expanded to, to manufacturing and, and we can help with all that right now. So I do think this is something that that is really, you know, important. Yeah, so so these these initiatives, these these no regret steps, if you will, are the very initiatives that are keeping the lights on. So. Very, very important feedback there, Scott. Michael, uh, I, I think all of the practitioners always are most eager to hear from uh, their peers. And, and, and this particular question is, is, is for you. Uh, this person wants you to, to put yourself back in the time machine, right? Go, go back to before FlowServe 2.0. What advice would you have given yourself to overcome those greatest challenges or hurdles that you faced? I think, you know, if we look back prior to um, the new strategy at FlowServe, as you mentioned, FlowServe 2.0, um, I think the, the, the biggest thing that, that we would have done differently is realize the value of data. Um, I think many folks were, were willing to um, state uh, that they believe there was value in data and more importantly, good quality, uh, clean data. Um, but I think few of our leaders prior to then were willing to commit and invest in the way that uh, they have since then. Um, data in many respects and getting data clean is um, critical to uh, business processes operating efficiently. Um, and if you go after the business process first without the data, uh, as we saw in our Finance Shared Service Center, um, you're gonna run into operational issues. Absolutely. Um, thanks for that, Michael. Another question just, just popping right now. Uh, is there any specific distribution service available for key mapping from S4 to R3 systems? Maybe, uh, Luke, uh, a question for you. Mm, that sounds really technical. <laughs> Could you say that again, please? <laughs> sure. Uh, are there any specific distribution services available for key mapping from S4 to R3 systems? Oh, key mapping. Yeah, actually within MDG, there's already a key mapping capabilities within there. So what you could do actually is to uh, have MDG set up as uh, in a S4, MDG for S4, and actually the MDG for S4 can actually work with the uh, your existing ECC as well as the S4 that you have over forward. And then within MDG, there's a uh, key mapping capabilities inside there. 
So that actually helps you see what is going on in your ECC environment and also what is been uh, what is actually being managed in your current S4 environment. But obviously it's a very high level overview um, and require a very technical response as well. So this is best actually explored with a, uh, the technical team and so on. But at this high level, it certainly can work that way. Excellent, Luke. Uh, Michael, we're going to bounce back to you, kind of another customer sided uh, question here. Uh, folks are always interested in, in ROIs, business cases. How did you justify the ROI for, for such a large scale project like FlowSerk 2.0? Uh, that's a great question and um, one that's important for initiatives like this to be able to have longevity and, and deliver on the impact that they need. At FlowServe, um, when we uh, laid out our new strategy, um, over 200 initiatives, as I mentioned, were highlighted that would need to um, be executed in order for the benefits of our new strategy to take hold. And as our executive leadership began to look at those initiatives, uh, they began to, to realize that uh, data was critical for those initiatives to realize their full potential and their full benefit. Um, and so what we did was we tied the investment um, for our MDG program um, to uh, those programs as success criteria um, and got our executive leadership on board to make that investment. And so tying it to very specific and strategic initiatives and showing the interdependency of data on the success of those initiatives was how we were able to get approval from our executive leadership uh, as well as our board of directors. Excellent, excellent. Uh, Scott, we're gonna bounce back uh, now to you. You you were the one that, that brought it up. It's, it's obviously a, a, an item of focus right now for Utopia, what we're helping customers do. And this is, uh, a question around some confusion around what hub mode is. Uh, can you can you elaborate on uh, what MDG and hub is all about and, and what value that brings to the customer? Sure, sure. And I'll, I'll, I'll echo what Luke said. It's a, it can be a technical architecture discussion. So if you want the next level of peeling the onion, grab one of those 15 minute sessions. We'll invite one of our enterprise architects on to chat with you about exactly what it means. So, so I'll put that out there first. But but it, it, in a simple way. About 85% of all the you know, thousands of customers that have deployed MDG, um, you know, and, and again, our experience is often deploying it around our enterprise asset management version or our retail and fashion management version. But about 85% of all the customers, you can either put S you can put MDG directly on top of your core SAP system. Um, and that's got some advantages, but it tends to kind of couple the speed of master data cleanup and, and change with the speed of the upgrade of your core system. So instead companies just do a little standalone deployment of MDG. It sits by itself, it synchronizes all the data automatically, as Luke said, all the data model uh, integration, all the updates to SAP itself, whatever version, you know, it can be ECC, it can be S4, it doesn't really matter, but it also does synchronization, harmonization to all your other systems. You know, if you're like FlowServe and you've got 40 ERPs, Michael, is that right? You know, yes. how, do you, how, do you, how, do you, how can you drop, drop the data onto a middleware and update those systems when that valuable data, um, you know, is, is a big question. So, so hub mode just means that you're running a little tiny instance of, of SAP S4 these days by itself instead of running it on top of your core system. And what that means is it gives you that flexibility is the reason companies do it. But in this particular case, this no regret step case, what it means is I get a little tiny S4 instance inside my environment, whether that's a hosted environment, whether I've got it on-prem, whatever it might be, managed environment. But then I start to get experience with it from the IT side. I actually have an S4 system. I can, you know, Michael, you guys have had a S4 finance system for a number of years now that you deployed uh, before MDG. It also was to get that experience, you know, so, so I think it just lets you plays the wrong word, but let you give you an S4 instance you can play with a little bit and get familiar with prior to taking, so, you, so then you're just more comfortable and can explain the benefits of the much larger program. And to some degree, it's a tiny baby step. Once you've taken that step and you've installed S4 once in your environment, you're going to probably keep doing it. So, Yeah, it makes, makes good sense, Scott. And, and both from a technology perspective, the, the technology folks of the organization can get familiar with the technology behind S4 and then also on the user side, uh, you can already start taking those those baby steps toward uh, stronger user adoption, building that system comfortability. So I think that, that makes great sense. 
Luke, we're going to head back to you. You've, you've been quiet for a while, so I'm going to go ahead and pick on you now a, a little bit. Uh, it's, it's a topic that you've already started to elaborate on, but uh, the, uh, the attendee uh, would like a little bit more um, uh, detail around. Uh, we have MDG on our ECC system. Can't this MDG be used when we move to s hana Okay, if you have MDG on your current ECC system, you can continue to use this MDG as you move to s hana However, the only thing you have to be aware of is that we have MDG on s hana that is very different from the MDG on the ECC system. And a lot of the new innovations, things like the data quality metrics, the dashboard, then you get to see the Fury screens and even machine learning and all those stuff are all, all built into the MDG for HANA, uh, as for HANA. So basically, if you continue using MDG on your ECC work to work your S for HANA environment, you are basically like driving an old car um, on a brand new expressway. So you really cannot enjoy all the all the all the, 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 the benefits there. So thing is that it's best to run MDG for S4 HANA on MDG or on an S4 environment. With that, you can still manage your ECC environment. So you're actually enjoying all the benefits of the new MDG capabilities while still be able to retain and work your ECC. So it is not a must, but again, you are losing benefits if you continue with the old MDG. Hope that helps. Absolutely, no. That's 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 good elaboration there, Luke. We we appreciate that. Uh, Michael, bouncing back to you, you had mentioned uh, data dictionaries, and, and you perked somebody's interest. So, uh, mentioning data dictionaries related to industry standards, could you speak a little bit more about the approach of implementing uh, solutions utilizing external data sources? Yeah. So, a uh, couple of clarifications when when we embarked on our MDG program. Um, we had S4 HANA as our uh, future single ERP in mind. Um, and so much of the data dictionary work that we did at FlowServe um, used uh, the S4 model for a customer and a supplier uh, as the, the beginning point for all of our data dictionaries. And our goal was to try to stay as close to that with as little customization as possible. Now, that was an aspiration. The reality at FlowServe, given that we were needing to syndicate our master data down to so many different ERP and non-ERP systems, uh, we did a good bit of work in our implementation of taking our enterprise standard model um, that's S4 based and mapping it to um, the various disparate systems that we have here at FlowServe. Um, and it's really an effort and an exercise in uh, understanding how uh, the MDG model semantically relates to um, data models and other systems and attempting to bridge the gap with those. Excellent, excellent, Michael. Uh, Scott, we're gonna move back to you. Uh, it says, I am part of a IT organization at a large uh, multinational retailer. Uh, how can these solutions be applied to uh, an organization in retail? Great question. I mean, again, I know we, we kind of, have, I think just because we got Mike along with us, we've talked a lot about oil and gas and assets and items and those sorts of things, um, you know, because that's that's the world that in there. But absolutely, I mean, master data is universal. I mean, whether you're talking about custom, Michael mentioned customers, suppliers, um, finance, these are all areas that are universal. Everybody has those, those attributes, whether you're B2C, B2B, so, so these are all areas you, you, you can focus on because they're universal. And again, MDG is awesome at that because it has those pre-built data models. It plugs right into the business partner framework in S4. It plugs right into the material master framework or, or you know, plant ma maintenance framework with assets. Pivoting to retail, again, some retailers are really thriving right now. Some are really struggling. But there's always this, this need to bring new products again, you know, as you're, as you're looking for alternate sources for some of the stuff we, we know aren't on the shelves right now. How, how easy is it to get those new products in, deal with those new SKUs, get old SKUs out that you can't get supply for anymore. It's a very labor intensive manual process, usually spreadsheet driven. And in retail, what you want to do is push that work out to your vendors and have them input that information when they found their own alternate supplies, uh, maybe for the same thing. And toilet paper always comes to mind for me. 
you know, and at a point you're like, I don't care if it's Charmin, I just need some toilet paper. So, you know, they, they have to manage that process, get those products in and do it so quickly right now with all the changes that are going on and, and places they're finding suppliers. So MDG for retail and fashion management helps you do exactly that. Manage your SKUs, manage your articles on and off your, your SAP platform very, very quickly. Um, and often by letting your vendors help you do that instead of having to do it yourself using spreadsheets. Excellent. Luke, uh, moving back over to you. Uh, question just coming in. When you say migration experts, are they uh, subject matter experts from SAP or are they from partner organizations like Utopia? Okay, actually, I was in the process of typing out the answer for this, but great that I can actually answer this easily uh, verbally. Well, we, we do have SAP migration experts and uh, internally, so they are the ones who actually day in, day out, brief migration and work with migration. So they are the right person to talk to. But at the same time, they also work with uh, our partners uh, like Utopia and so on, because they also uh, are not as deep in terms of some of the uh, technologies like the, um, the, what the, enterprise asset and the retail as uh, Utopia folks are. So they will leverage and tap on the uh, partners who have the kind of in-depth experience and together they can actually provide the much better uh, advice to, uh, to the customers in terms of migration strategy. Excellent, makes, makes good sense, Luke. And, and certainly when we're talking about asset intensive organizations, or organizations in retail and fashion, uh, it is the data subject matter expertise at Utopia that, that is a differentiator there. Uh, Michael, maybe you could elaborate a little bit more. Uh, this attendee is, is wondering more around uh, the, how you brought the business and IT uh, to the same table to, to see eye to eye uh, and translate some of the closer 2.0 IT and technology initiatives into business value for the business. No, it's a great question, and it's a, a critical piece to the MDG puzzle. Um, first and foremost, we set the expectation uh, right up front that the uh, our MDG journey was not an IT journey, um, but it was in fact a business journey. Uh, everything that we did to uh, set up and establish the program, including our governance organization, um, was a business-oriented and business-led endeavor. Um, and so, first and foremost, that's critical. Um, to uh, ensuring that the two teams do come together um, and the business doesn't simply rely on IT, thinking this is just a technical implementation. Um, more specifically, um, I was actually part of uh, our uh, FlowServe transformation um, initiative program group. Uh, I had responsibility for MDM, which was a, uh, one of uh, a handful of pillars in our transformation program. Um, and so it started off with very good uh, connection and interaction with the very group at FlowServe that was leading that transformation. Um, from there, it, it was um, much of what you would typically do in any business implementation, working very closely with the senior leaders in each of the functions in the organization that are impacted by um, master data or poor quality master data and ensuring that you've got buy-in commitment um, both for the program, but as well as for their role in the program in order for it to be successful. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's when the IT organization and the business come together as one, uh, when, when organizations find, find the best results, no, no doubt about it. Uh, Scott, a, a two-part question for you. The first uh, part is I will continue to play my role as, as host and, and ask you, uh, does Utopia do only data cleansing or does Utopia also do data migration, data migration from ECC to S4 HANA? Yeah, great question, Tom. The short answer is we, we do we do everything data related for, for SAP and non-SAP systems. We say that we sort of swim in an SAP centric pond around data, but what you typically find is data migration is treated as one task, and that literally is just taking the data out of the old SAP or other systems and making sure that it's in a format that will load into the new S4 system. Um, and that's a mistake because that's a technical activity. It's not a business value-led activity. What you find though, is the exact same technology and approaches that help you do that data understanding and then the data mappings, as, as Luke said, to then get it into your new S4 system, give you the opportunity to do automated cleansing, machine learning, uh, bring your subject matter experts, and really for 
not a whole lot more money in the grand scheme of things is what just the data migration piece will cost you. You can actually have substantial cleansing and enrichment benefits and have much better, better data in your new system, not just something that they said, hey, whatever you give me, I'll make sure it loads in the new system. So the short answer is absolutely we do all those things, but we view it as an integrated activity. I mean, it, I can't think of the last time we did a major data migration program for S4 where we didn't work with the business and work with the organization to improve the data as part of that. So we think that's critical. Absolutely. And, and, and again, going back to how organizations find and extract that, that immediate business value, whether it's by way of, of operational performance, uh, inventory cost reduction, uh, what have you, that, that immediate value that they gain all along the way as they, they move down that road. Uh, Scott, the, the other part of this question, uh, again, kind of a utopia-centric question, some companies are offering data as a service offering already. Is this something that Utopia is offering as well? I, and I say this with a, a brief smile because I know that this is a, uh, a topic very close to you right now. Yeah, you know, there's a couple of pieces that the, fir the first one is our executive leadership very quickly as part of our digital pivot said, we have programs in flight, we got customers that are struggling. So we have an initiative called Uflex, which is really about how can we work creatively with the customers we're already either doing business with or planning to do business in the short term to help our, their financial goals and their financial challenges line up with how we can help them. So whether it's um, you know, various ways to, to help fund things or look at projects that is slightly differently um, are things that we've been able to deploy very quickly uh, to, to keep the conversations going and to keep the projects moving um, was kind of the first phase. But to your point, um, you know, our project uh, Nirvana, as we're calling it right now, uh, you know, TBD trademarked, is really about taking all the capabilities we bring to bear for these solutions, you know, whether it's data cleansing and enrichment, MDG is a hosted solution, other solutions out there from Utopia, Utopia Data Governance Accelerator uh, capabilities, and bringing that all in-house and hosting that in a, in a hyperscaler environment. And really, you know, giving customers access to that as software as a service. So they pay a monthly fee and they can have access to everything we were talking about helping them with um, across a broad spectrum, you know, again, from cleansing to migration, uh, you know, to the actual MDG platform itself. So, again, as, as Michael said, if you've got a big MDG deployment that, that can't move forward for similar reasons that S4 can't, we can engage and give you a way that's both, uh, you know, you know, operationally excellent, uh, so op OPEX, you know, focused and bite-sized chunks without having to bring in new technology into your infrastructure. And that's really something we're really excited about on the customer launching right now, looking for clients to, 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 to uh, partner with on that. Excellent, Scott. Uh, Luke, we're going to go ahead and, and just hit you one more time here. Uh, and I'm going to be incredibly rude and ask for just a 30 second kind of quick response. I want to make sure we get this question in. What is the standard time frame to complete an implementation for a medium-sized business to move from SAP ECC to S4 HANA, given that they already have MDG deployed on top of ECC for business process and materials? Well, I'll say that it can typically range from three months to about nine months. That would be a, the, the fastest and the easiest estimate I can have. But again, best to talk to the migration consultants and they can actually advise you in better detail then. Excellent, Luke, and thank you, thank you for, for being so uh, quick with the response as well, because we are at the top of the hour. Before I close things out, just a couple of very important quick announcements. Uh, please do mark your calendars for June 18th. That's Thursday, June 18th, 10 a.m. Central Time for a very exciting Utopia Live on retail fashion management. Uh, and we're going to be talking about all things master data governance in the retail and fashion spaces article master, vendor portal, some of the latest and greatest new functionality specifically for retail and fashion organizations. With that, I would like to thank all of our panelists today, uh, Michael Bagala, IT Executive, FlowServe Corporation, Luke Kwong, Luke is Director of the Cloud Platform, EIM and MDG go-to-market teams at SAP, and of course, Utopia's very own Scott Barrett. Vice President at Utopia. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, just by the flow of questions that we saw coming in, uh, I can say that our audience really took a lot away from today's conversation. So thank you, gentlemen. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Thanks for joining today. We trust you found the content to be valuable and hope that it will help fuel your initiatives. You will soon receive an email with a recording of today's Utopia Live, along with the presentation deck, 
and a link to schedule a follow-up discussion with today's subject matter experts. Utopia looks forward to helping solve your greatest business challenges. For more information and to view all prior Utopia Lives, visit utopiainc.com slash live.